Well, thanks again, obviously, for meeting me today, because I'm sure, you know, you are pretty busy. I'm so busy today. I'm <laughs> so swamped. But you're doing the haunt right now, too, right? Yeah, the Mad Effects Lab. I want to know a little bit about your background and specifically what got you into film um, and even more specifically special effects. Uh, well, uh, I'm pretty much a geek since the time I was a little kid. So we'd sit in front of the TV, bowl of chips, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, Pepsi, you know, and it was just uh, that and drawing all the time in front of the TV, monsters and, mm -hmm. you know, build things out of Legos or whatever, you know, it was always mm -hmm. like building robots or monsters or, and then eventually the, you know, the magazines started coming out like Famous Monsters, you know, uh, Filmland, I, I grew up on those, and then mm -hmm. Fangoria, and it, they kind of showed how they were creating all this stuff, and I was like, holy crap, there's actually a business, I mean, you know, sure. there's actually an industry here, and people make a living doing, making monsters and designing this stuff, so. I would assume either you started off probably, you know, just being inspired and creating your own kind of unique stuff, or did you start, like you were just copying stuff? And Pretty then much. Sudden... I had friends that uh, had their own paper route, and I would help mm -hmm. my friends um, run the paper route, and we'd take our paper money and buy comic books. Mm -hmm. And then we'd go back and hang out all afternoon, you know, listen to music and drawing trying to copy the comic book pages or the covers, you know, mm -hmm. and draw them. And we just did that for a long time. And then eventually started, you know, working on our own original stuff when we started, you know, art classes and everything else. What were some of your favorite books? Marvel used to have this um, thing called Epic Illustrated. Okay. I think it was Marvel that put that out. It was like a, a magazine sized mm -hmm. thing. And it had different short stories from different authors and then different artists. Oh, you know, okay. Like yeah. Heavy Metal Magazine's another one that, you know, yeah. used to, and that was kind of taboo. We weren't allowed to, you know, if my mom caught me with heavy metal, she'd be upset because it had nudity and sex and everything in it. Of course, but, yeah. Yeah. On TV, you saw the behind the scenes stuff and you saw that people were actually making them. When would you say that you started? I, I really started doing the effects once I moved to LA. So I was mm -hmm. 19. Mm -hmm. I went to makeup school at Joe Blasco's for like a 12 week thing. And then, um, and then just started working around town um, at the mm -hmm. different effects shops. And then I, I kind of learned on the job uh, working with other artists that I came up in business with. So you moved out to LA at 19. How did mom and dad feel about that? I went to art school for a year okay. at CCAD in Columbus. Yeah. And then I dropped out oh. and said, I don't want to do that. I want to make monsters, you know, I don't mm. want to do that. Um, I just worked a summer, raised the money mm. to move to LA. And then, um, and then my parents put me on a plane. They took me out, mm. got an apartment and then left. Wow. Yeah, so I'm sure they were freaking out at the time. Makeup effects guys back then, it was kind of like a bunch of long-haired rock star dudes, <laughs> you know, and we'd all go out and club and, mm. and pretty much get wasted every weekend, you know? Yeah. And then work, and we were like 24-7, we'd work um, all night long sculpting in the garage, you know, and it'd be like five or six of us, and then we'd sculpt until we got tired, and then, then we'd go party. Yeah, and then you grow out of it once you start losing your hair, but... <laughs> No. I hope that never yeah. happens. Yeah, good luck with that. What did you feel like was the first really big project you took on that you were really, you know, excited about? Uh, before we started KMB Effects, mm -hmm. uh, we were uh, freelancing me, Howard, and Greg for about five years, um, okay. and we were working at different shops. So I got to work, you know, on Predator and um, sure. the original Predator, and you know, Invaders from Mars and Aliens. Even though I don't have credit on that, it was in the shop on Aliens as well. Oh wow! Um, doing molds and, and stuff. So those were really cool movies to to work on and mm -hmm. coming up in the business, like Night of the Creeps or Phantasm Two or From Beyond or Evil Dead. Those are all movies. Evil Dead Two. We did working at other shops. Uh, after Evil Dead, I moved. I came back from North Carolina and uh, rented out a little thousand square foot shop. And, and then we ended up renting that little space out to other artists who needed it for their shows, like Steve Wang, who was doing Hell Comes to Frogtown and, yeah. and his little Kung Fu Rascals movie. And so we would, that's how we kept the, the shop open, even though we had no jobs coming in. And nobody would give us a shot until um, the guy who wrote um, Evil Dead 2, Scotty Spiegel, yeah. um, 
called us one day and said, I'm doing this little movie called Intruder. It's low budget and we don't have any money, very low, you know. Mm. But, you know, I need some kid to build my stuff in a garage or something. Do you have anybody you can recommend, like up and comer? He gave us a shot on that movie and we built everything for nothing. And then mm -hmm. that was our first credit. And then it kind of went, okay, now we have one on our belt. And then we nailed a couple more with some of the filmmakers we were working with, Brian Usna, who was make, uh, recommended us to this company that was doing this movie called uh, Night Wish. And, and mm -hmm. there was another one called Night Angel, and um, they mm -hmm. were just, you know, these low-budget movies, but we would come in and do things fairly cheap, you know, because we were starving, you know, yeah. wanted, to, wanted to work, wanted the credits, and, uh, and so we got this reputation for being able to pull things off on a budget, yeah. and, uh, and it looked good, you know. It, you know, movies would move us in, like Dust Till Dawn moved us into a new facility because we didn't have the space to do all this stuff. In sure. the shop we were in, and then, then we did. Uh, we moved to Van Nuys, and we did this movie called Evolution. It was a yeah. Ivan Reitman movie. Yeah. And we had to build all these twenty-foot long dragons, <laughs> and and we have nowhere to put it. Plus, we had this giant sphincter asshole thing. Do you remember that thing? That, oh yeah. Um, we had to build that. It's all on cables, and um, you know, it was held up by a crane. Right. So we had to make it like pie sections and sew it together, and it was this giant cable-controlled sphincter. Yeah. You know, and it was like. We just had nowhere to do it, so we had to move into a bigger shop just to do that movie, you know? Wow. So, um, but anyway, uh, you know, the, yeah, there's movies over the years I really liked working on. Evil Dead, Army of Darkness, Evil Dead 2, you know? Yeah. Um, Misery, you know, Dancing with Wolves. And then there's a lot of low-budget stuff like Brighter Reanimator and things like that are just cool mm. and fun to have worked on, you know? A lot of people just naturally assume through reading bios or learning something about a person that it's like, yeah, I'm out there and I'm just working on all these projects and now I just got to a point where I'm like, yeah, I'm just going to open up my own shop, which it doesn't... Most of us yeah. started out working at other people's studios and eventually started our own studio. Like sure. all, all the guys I came up in the business with went on to start Optic Nerve or, you know, oh, yeah. uh, you know and, and, and even the guys that worked with us, you know, over the years mm. branched off and started their own shops. It's changed over the years. Back when we got into it, it was like the heyday. It was like the 80s, and it mm -hmm. was the big boom of like everything had to have rubber monster stuff in it. You know, right. every single horror film had to have something in it. You know. Yeah. And um, now it's a little, you know, it's different now. A little mix of CG. Sure. And um, you know. But you do both here, don't you? We do. Yeah. I'm not a big, you know, fan of doing CG. Sure. But I, it, it's a good tool. Mm -hmm. Has the work suffered at all? No. You know what? What's changed is there's no giant monster movie being made again you know right. I mean, after jurassic park there was as uh, there's no need to build a giant six, 60 foot puppet you know yeah. for anything it's like it just makes no sense i mm. mean to, and the, it costs so much to build something I mean, the last thing we did that big mechanically was uh the violator from spawn okay and that was a you know, a 12 foot tall hydraulic puppet and it costs yeah. like 80 grand just for the parts. It just makes no sense now. I mean, if I was doing a, a movie yeah. with, you know, giant monster in it, I, right. although Jurassic Park is cool because they do actually have those pieces, those real, you know, pieces that interact. Right. And, you know, and it looks great. They, they seamlessly cut it together, but right. um, Guillermo del Toro does it really well now too, yeah. where he mixes the practical and the, and the digital. So. A lot of the stuff now that I see, I feel like, is overly digital. There's nothing amazing about it anymore. That's the mm. thing, because you know that they can do anything now. Um, so the only thing that you know sets movies apart now is the storyline and the mm. characters. If it, you know, and, right? And this, that 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 other stuff was just kind of bonus. When did you feel like your work was being established? Well, first off, uh, I'm never totally comfortable with. I mean. You can never be comfortable. So sure. it really comes down to the connection to the filmmaker and your ideas design-wise because mm. technically there's a, on the technical side, everybody kind of uses the same stuff and same materials and kind of approach, you know, we, we have all the same tools. Right. And it all comes down to, you know, concept and design and then also your relationship with the filmmaker. You know, there's so many filmmakers I've worked with that it just have no, you, talk to them about creatures and design and stuff, and they have a freaking clue what the, you know, what they even want, mm -hmm. you know, and then you work with a filmmaker 
that knows what he wants. Sure. And it's it's a different dynamic. But and I, I think we've always, you know, even here at, at Creature Core, we uh, we like to work on big projects and small projects. So it doesn't really. Sure. I mean, we kind of like hooking up with an independent filmmaker that has a cool script. You know, you get it and you go, I, I want to be involved with this. Yeah, I know the budget's not big, but you know what? You get a ton of press from it when it hits, you know what sure. I mean? Your fan base for the films is solid, so. Yeah. Um, you know, it's the same thing with Tusk. Mm. So, um, you know, it wasn't, of course, I, I heard the idea and went, this is ridiculous. But you know what? It was a good script, so I, I enjoyed it and yeah. wanted to work with Kevin. So, mm. it's, you know, there's that connection. Yeah. So. When did you meet Kevin Smith? There used to be this store called Dave's Laser, and uh, it was a laser disc store. It was on uh, Ventura Boulevard in, um, mm. in uh, L.A. So we used to collect the laser discs for the movies when we worked with a star like Eddie Murphy. I'd bring in, you know, <laughs> his live performance laser disc and mm. have him sign it. You know, and because everybody kind of knows everybody because we grew up we're watching the same movies and everything, and then, sure. and all working with the same filmmakers. Like at that point, we were already working with Quentin and mm. and stuff. So it was like he knew who we were, we knew who he was. Yeah. And it was like. Hey, how's it going? What are you getting? Hey, cool. All right, see ya. You know, and that was the first time. Then I hadn't seen him forever after that. And really? Until this project came up. You have kind of a cool story about working with Quentin Tarantino on his first film and also <laughs> That's, him yeah. on yours. Originally, John Esposito my, was my, my, one of my best friends mm. who wrote Stephen King's Graveyard Shift and the Walking Dead web series and stuff like that. Okay. He, um, he, uh, was going to write the screenplay for Dusk originally. Mm. Then he got shipped off to shoot uh, Graveyard Shift. So we put the word out to a couple friends, and then you know suddenly, hey, there's this guy. You should read some of his scripts, you know. And so there's Reservoir Dogs, Natural Born Killers, and True Romance are handed to me, <laughs> you know, before anybody had bought them wow. or anything. Yeah. And so we ended up meeting with Quentin. At that time, Quentin didn't have a car. Lived at home. <laughs> was working the video store, you know, <laughs> and I'd have to drive to uh, Glendale and pick him up and then drive him back to the shop. Mm -hmm. And then we'd hang out. We all hit it off because we all grew up on the same stuff and had the same kind of, mm -hmm. you know, we, you mention any movie, we had, you know, and he's like encyclopedic, you know. We paid him $1,500 okay. to write the screenplay, which allowed him to quit his job <laughs> at the video store yeah. and start writing full time. Sure. Uh, we're the first people to ever pay him to write an original screenplay. Then we struggled for 10 years to get the movie made. Mm -hmm. Nobody wanted to make it because it was a really weird movie where it suddenly just shifted gears three quarters of the way through the movie, you know. <laughs> and everybody in town thought it was vulgar and passed on it, you know, because mm. it had the you know, Chet Pussy speech and everything in it. Right. And it took 10 years till Robert Rodriguez coming off the heat of Desperado and, um, and um, you know, El Mariachi. Yeah. Uh, became interested in it because he had hooked up with Quentin at some film festivals and they, okay. so uh, and you know the, it, the problem was I own the script mm -hmm. so like they f pretty much felt for like a year or so that uh, they couldn't do the movie because I wanted to direct it mm. so and I, I struggled with that for 10 years until I just got so sick mm. that I wanted to get the movie made so I'm like you know what I'm just gonna get this movie made. I don't care mm. let me do the effects and I'll be a producer on it and sure and get the movie made. Sure. And that was the best decision I ever made because, you know, it turned from like what would have been a million dollar movie with me trying to get it off the ground to direct mm. it to a, you know, $17 million movie with Clooney and all these stars in it, you know? Right. And that was the other thing. Uh, part of it was if, if he writes a screenplay, you know, for the price, whatever, will, would we, you know, swap out some effects for Reservoir Dogs? So, you know, yeah. we did the ear gag and everything. So, so the first one you drew, you actually wrote and directed would would have been well I mean uh, Demolitionist was uh, Demolitionist and that was um, uh, started out as a movie that I wanted to do raise the money low budget three hundred fifty thousand something type you know little sure. kind of Miss Forty Five revenge picture and then it it changed in a little sci fi thing and mainly because the distributors mm. wanted something particular and we tailored it for them the, the producer on that was Don Borchers we did this movie called Doppelganger. Mm. with Don, when it was Drew Barrymore was in it. And um, the director was Avi Nesher, and then I ended up uh, shooting all these miniatures and these puppets and everything. And, mm -hmm. and Don was like, holy crap, you're really cooking here. He goes, if you ever, ever want to direct anything, it, you know, send it to me and maybe we'll get something off the ground. Yeah. 
eh, I didn't think anything of it until later. And then, you know, he called me one day and said, hey, do you got anything? I said, yeah, I got this little revenge movie. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And I sent him a picture of a piece of artwork that Sean Bisson had done for me, which is, it was kind of this chick with guns and, you know, tight superhero looking thing. Yeah. And, um, and he goes, he, he took that piece of artwork and then sent it to the distributor, mm -hmm. gave him the pitch, and they said, uh, we're in. So that's how fast it happened. Then, wow. then suddenly we had to write a new script because it was uh, now a different movie. They wanted sci-fi right. elements and more of a RoboCop thingy. And wow. then it took a few years after that till Wishmaster happened. So, mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then 10 years from the time I did Wishmaster before I directed again. At that point, video was kind of the that whole video market where like if you're going to direct straight to video, mm. you felt like a failure. Okay. You know what I mean? And yeah. Like, especially if you had a theatrical movie come out. Right. So right after Wishmaster, I got offered tons of these movies. Like, you know, it would be like Killer Spiders in the Jungle or, you know, it was like. Right. And, and there were these low budget movies for filmmakers like Brian Usna and, you know, producers yeah. that were calling and um, who did Reanimator and stuff and The Bride. But, and I, for years and, I, you know, sometimes I wish I didn't, I would have just like taken them all and try to make something cool sure but um but I didn't direct for 10 years mainly because I was stubborn and didn't want to do anything till I could do a theatrical again and then mm. and I and I set up a bunch of movies that never got made yeah I was attached to a bunch of movies I, I set up I sold a couple uh, screenplay ideas and mm. and uh, we were in development and then they never got made so I was this eventually you know and at, at that point the studios dump money into the development so now you can't you can't get your movie back unless you buy it back Right. So it's like, it's, just, you know, so you just, uh, I guess I'll forget about that one, mm -hmm. you know. But if I ever got, you know, a gazillion, won the lottery, I'd be buying back all my projects. Sure. So, and they're just sitting on shelves. And even with, like, going all the way back to Dusk, you mentioned how it was a unique concept, and it really was. Um, so with Dusk and, um, you know, even like Wishmaster, I'm wondering where you kind of get your inspiration from because it's different for ev everyone well I like to work with other writers okay. I'm not a, I don't consider myself a writer so okay um, I'm kind of a, more of an idea guy and then I mm. like to work with somebody on things but um, th basically uh, just coming up you're trying to come up with something original um, and then you know like for instance I, I did this movie called junk mm. um, which was um, uh, we sold to dimension and Wes Craven was attached to produce Mm -hmm. And then we went through a year of development and never got made. Sure. So, and I was, that was going to be my big break, you know, that movie. Mm -hmm. And then it didn't happen. I was going to be do, it was a kid's movie about these kids that thwart an alien invasion by um, building uh, uh, all the junk in a junkyard into battle bots to defend the earth. It's like, <laughs> it was like me trying to do an our gang movie. Yeah. Set in, you know, in a, and what happened was I was up to direct the movie Monster House. Mm -hmm. which uh, was made into an animated feature yeah. eventually, but it was a live action movie when I went in to meet about it. So I had come up with all this artwork and put all this really cool design stuff with the monster house and the teeth and the eyes and the attacking things and mm -hmm. built all this really fun stuff. And then um, I went in for like five or six meetings with the producers and it was, um, it was uh, Robert Zemeckis' company producing okay. you know, and Spielberg's company. And I go in for one pitch, they call me back because they like the ideas, and I go in for another and another and another. And then they tell me, you know, it's between you and one other guy. I was so mad after that that I, I go, I got, I'm going to make my own kid's movie. <laughs> so what happened was um, my friend Mike McCarty, who worked at the shop, mm -hmm. was pitching this movie idea, but I liked the title. It was called Junk. But it was kind of virus-esque. It was about an alien life force that crashes like a um, energy thing that crashes in a junkyard and then yeah. turns everything into vi you know like that movie Virus where the yeah. uh, uh, the robot you know it becomes an evil robot very thing. Lovecraftian I'd say even right and I I said nah I, I that's too much like that other movie but I like the title let's let's move this let's switch this around mm -hmm. so I, I pitched him the other di idea and then he he wrote a little treatment up and I kept him attached to it as a story guy mm -hmm. and then we went out and set this pitch up and then sold the movie. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, um, and then it never got made. So <laughs> that's one movie I, I would like to get back. And Dimension yeah. still owns it. So I need to okay. somehow get it back someday. Can you talk a little bit about some of the unique processes you might have 
I mean, everything's different. Every, every everything you do is you got a different. Uh, you have to approach it differently because yeah, you may, you may have done it a million times, but this mm. particular movie might have one thing that doesn't work the way you usually do it. Now you got to think around. Like some of the materials have changed over the years because now they have these companies that are designing specifically for us. Yeah, as makeup guys, and that's kind of what's cool. Now you got really plasticky things that you can like stretch and yeah. you know it's like you know we did this movie is coming out in a few weeks um called late phase where we'll film and they had to have a scene where somebody pulls their face off to reveal the, the monster beneath oh, and yeah. so we couldn't have done that without silicone i mean it stretched and stretched and then ripped the pieces you know and it mm. cool do you tend to take projects just based on the fact that you like the story or do you think more about in terms of what kinds of things you'd be making? Uh, both. Uh, yeah. Some are f uh, taking the financial aspect of it mm. and knowing what, if you can actually do something on the budget they have sure, uh, and not look like an idiot. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, you want to be able to deliver. So the, mm. the budget means something, but more than that, it's the filmmaker and the vision the filmmaker might have. So At some point in your career, you moved back from LA, do you find that it's difficult sometimes working with clients because of the location? Yes and no. I mean, mm. uh, a lot of the time, it doesn't matter where you build it, you end up shipping it somewhere anyway to True. do the work, you know, to do the set work. True. Um, and it just depends. I mean, um, there's certain filmmakers that I've worked with over the years that will always give me a call if mm. they're doing a film. So um, the only thing is you want them to make a movie every year. <laughs> and it's not always that way. Sometimes it's two years between projects right. for a director, you know. So, um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe a little bit, but I think I make it up with a little m more uh, relaxed uh, lifestyle mm -hmm. here. What, what exactly was the reason you decided to come back? I hate L.A. No, I hate L.A. <laughs> I hate L.A. We had, our kids were really young, about, um, you know, four years old. Yeah. And we felt that if we're going to move... We should do it now before they can become too entrenched, embedded in, in that lifestyle or whatever the L.A. scene and have too many friends, they, you know what I mean? Yeah, Attachments. Sure. And it was just easier, you know, to bring them back and get them, you know, they could grow up with grandparents and, and the cousins and have this nice family unit, which yeah. is, it's been great. Yeah. And before we were in L.A. and we never saw anybody, sure. you know, never got home. Yeah. And so, um, and that was, that was the biggest thing. I mean, and I think it was really important for the kids to have that family unit. Oh yeah, I would agree. And it sounds like you're kind of a family guy too. And I just mean that in the sense that in this industry, everyone is busy all the time and I'm sure you're working all the time, but you know, even- I work all the time, but I'm five minutes from home, you know. It's which like, is great. And I don't, I you go to location a lot, but mm -hmm. although you know, I get to work on King Kong or something and it's just like, kind of want to go yeah Lord, oh Lord yeah of the absolutely. Rings, you want to go when the Lord it was funny because Peter Jackson um, there was a Peter had that movie uh, he was just coming over here it was before the Frighteners he had a movie called Dead Alive mm -hmm. that um, he was screening out in LA and he came to the shop hung out with us I had him over for dinner it was actually kind of cool we were hanging out watching movies at my apartment wow and um, and he was, we went to the screening, now, I think it was New Beverly or something, it was down in Hollywood. Hmm. And it was just a screening for agents. He was trying to get an agent. They invited everybody from the shop down. So we all split from the shop, went down. We're all sitting in this theater. It's us and a bunch of executives, uh, you know, suits mm -hmm. behind us. And they're all sitting at the back. They have no clue what they're in for, you know. We didn't either. We're sitting there and, you know, the movie starts and, it's just nonstop goofy blood and bloodletting. And then by the end of the movie, when it's that big battle with the zombies mm -hmm. that just goes on and on and on, and then the lawnmower's out and he's chopping everybody up with it, we were going insane. We were just going nuts. And they, the people in the back were like, what is it with these guys? They're freaking howling and you know, hooting it up. Mm -hmm. We had such a great time with that. But then right after that, see, Richard Taylor, who was his effects guy who went on to do all the Lord of the Rings movies and stuff, yeah. Richard would come over to our shop and, you know, check out what we were doing and how we were doing it because mm. they were just starting to do this, uh, that effects stuff over there. And now he's, you know, he's a juggernaut, you know, he's right. at this point. But Richard would come over and Tanya and, uh, and hang out. And then 
the next thing we know, they're doing Lord of the Rings, and or well, this is after they do the Frighteners first, and then. But once they had Lord of the Rings going, they were calling, and, and suddenly half of our crew was like, "I'm moving to New Zealand, you know, because <laughs> we're going to work on Lord of the Rings." And yeah. everybody just split to New Zealand. Wow. So and lived over there for years. I still have friends that are li living over there. Really. You know, Gino Acevedo, we used to paint for us and everything and sculpt and. He's like the head guy over there. He does all the digital modeling and painting now of all their creatures and stuff. He's brilliant. How, so. many, how many different places would you say you've traveled that your career has taken you? Not as many as I'd like. Yeah. I still would. I haven't been to England yet. I haven't been to really? uh, Eastern Europe or any, you know. Yeah. Uh, I haven't been. Uh, I, I, New Zealand, Italy, um, India, India mm. uh, Canada, of course. Mm. Um, but you know, never. I'd like to go, you know, to France or something, or, you yeah. know, but, um, and definitely want to go to London and shoot something, but, um, we've had opportunities. Uh, there's been a couple of movies that shot like in, um, Bulgaria and stuff that, but I just didn't want to go. So, oh, okay. <laughs> so I sent somebody else. So <laughs> no, I'm not going. Has there ever been a project you've actually taken on where you just thought like, what the fuck is this? You know what I mean? Like just the most ridiculous thing you've ever had to make. Well, probably that frickin' walrus, but no, uh, <laughs> I mean, I had never, yeah, that's probably the weirdest thing I've ever, that, maybe the meat monster, you know, but yeah. there's been projects that I've not been happy with, you know, after, you know, mainly mm. because sometimes you, you don't have any control, you, you give them 10 designs and they pick the worst one, you know, and, and there's yeah. nothing you can do about it, yep. you go, really, I shouldn't have even shown that one, but you know what, we were trying to show you that we were doing a bunch of work here, and you had to pick the pink one. I don't really want to make a pink monster, but mm. that's the one you like, you know. And but you just live with it, and then, yeah. you know you move on. The thing about about it is try not to get too attached to things, because you know you make a movie, it goes, they put it out, either it finds a fan base or following, or mm. or it doesn't, and then you move on to the next one. Mm. I mean, you try to make every time you start a movie, it's like the most important thing you're working on at that point, mm. and then afterwards, it's like. What I, you know, yeah. two years later, it doesn't matter. I right. can tell you, like, I mean, I've had it happen, but it, it, probably the most frustrating thing, like, um, there's a company called ADI, Alec Gillis and uh, Tom Woodruff. They just did the remake of The Thing, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and they built all this amazing practical effects stuff, just beautiful work. Mm -hmm. And then they barely used any of it in the movie and replaced everything digitally. And it was so, so crushing, I'm sure, for them. Yeah. But if you go on YouTube, you can watch all the behind the scenes little things that they put together of them testing everything and showing everything in the shop. Yeah. It's brilliant stuff. Mm -hmm. And that, so that's got to be crushing. And, you know, when you do all this work and then, you know, they go, wow, I only want to see, I only want to see this much of it, you know, and you go got a whole thing here you're gonna waste it you know right and that's but just it there's no control over that unfortunately do you have something that you're really proud of making even if it was something like we just talked about something really early on that you might have even hated at the beginning but now you think back and yeah well uh from dust till dawn was really mm -hmm. proud of everything we pulled off of that and and to be honest we did a lot of stuff that didn't make it on film and some of it shouldn't have been put on film um but uh uh, yeah, I was, you know, the buff, you know, Dancing with Wolves was a big deal because it yeah. was our first movie that actually got us launched into doing big studio movies instead of low budget horror films. Mm. It was it was actually Gross Anatomy, which is a Disney movie. We did all these bodies for, and that kind of got us dances because we were doing realistic anatomical things, and they wanted realistic buffaloes. Yeah. So those 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 and like Misery and and things were like us getting to work with big A-list directors and filmmakers and actors, you know, mm -hmm. which changed everything for us and sure. became, you know, us getting to work on big movies more often, you know, yeah. and still keep our low budget route. Army of Darkness, probably the most fun I've ever had. That and Evil Dead 2. Okay. Um, most fun because we were young, stupid kids that, you know, just had a good time making boogity monster stuff at that point. And yeah. It was like kind of a club med, you know, or it's just the film crew isolated so it was like a family unit that oh you yeah kind of live with for three or four months and then then you have that that withdrawal after you leave and don't see anybody and everything gets everybody gets depressed it's kind of it's what happens every time i direct the movie right after i get done 
Yeah. In a movie wraps, it's like depression time. That's so. that's amazing that you say that because you can localize it even to how like sometimes family comes into town, they stay with you for like three or four days, and by the end of it, you're like, I wish they'd just fucking leave. But the second <laughs> they leave, right, you're and just, just and you're like, mm-hmm. where'd they go? I miss yeah. them. Yeah. yeah. I'm looking forward to the next couple. Are you doing the next Kevin Smith? Yeah, that's what we're going to LA. But uh, yeah, no, it's fun working with Kevin because we're doing a couple movies with him, mm. and uh, and he's a real blast to work with. Mm. He's creatively, it was just you know, there's a second hand with him, so it's really you know, we talk the same talk. It's it, it's it's cool. Yeah, you know, and um, and he always and he likes what we're doing. So I mean. Send him designs. He, he has input, but he really digs. You know, oh yeah, 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 I like that idea. Can you make it bigger? You know, it's that kind of thing. It's nice because he has a like a family unit of people that he works with, and yeah, and we get along with him great. So I've been geeking out since I've been here, so I really appreciate it, and I look forward to continuing to watch your work in the future. I'm retiring after this week, so it doesn't matter. You won't get to watch it anymore. I'll probably just do this until I croak. So <laughs> well, that's when my depression will set in. <laughs> Thanks Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for having me.